Well, good evening and welcome to the Midweek Bible Study. Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to have you a part of it as we're here online. Trust it's being a blessing to you. I trust you've had a good week uh, so far. I've had a lot of things going on around here at the church. Appreciate those who have come and helped with some of the trimming and weeding, the different things there. Thank you so much. Several have, uh, have mentioned they're going to come. Some have already come and help with some of that work. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining with us. I trust you'll take your Bibles and be able to follow along in just a little bit. Uh, be finding 2 Chronicles chapter 5. As you're doing that and as we're beginning, let me just mention to you some prayer requests that we have, some within our church family, some with extended connections out of our church family. But if I can mention those to you just uh, as we begin. First of all, uh, Nathan Bates if you would uh, please be in prayer for, brother, uh, for Nathan. He's had some tightness in his chest, uh, and they sent him to the doctor, sent him home, so he's resting, he's feeling better, but do keep him in mind. He's had a lot of things this past week, a lot of stress things, both from work and uh, some other scenarios, so be praying for him. He works in law enforcement, so that is a stress-filled situation. Beverly Collins uh, had uh, some surgery. She's recovering. Continue to pray for her. Pray for Wanda Callahan as she is uh, continuing her recovery with her foot. Uh, she went to the doctor, got a good report, I believe, on Monday, uh, but continue praying for her. And then Cindy Welch, that's Kathy Welch's sister. Uh, we've had her on the prayer list, we've been mentioning her. Uh, she seems to be, uh, she's with hospice now, and she seems to be digressing, and so keep her in your prayers. Uh, someone had called in the name of Brittany Johnson, her husband, and her two teenage sons. That's a family that I think lost their home and their clothes and things in a, in a fire. And so uh, do be in prayer for that family. I don't have any details from that, but do be in prayer for the family as they are uh, trying to pick up the pieces from that and uh, get things replaced. I know that they would appreciate it. Uh, so these are some within our church family, some connections from those within our church family that are others outside. And then also our Missionary of the Week. Our Missionary of the Week this week is the, the missionaries are the Blands. Uh, they serve in Costa Rica. And uh, there you can see the family. You've got uh, Jeremy and Michelle. And then the children are Lila, Elowen, and Elijah. They serve in Costa Rica. They had been in Nicaragua and had to uh, leave from there uh, because of some unrest and different situations, they're, they were back home for a while, and Brother Jeremy had communicated with us. They're back They're in Costa Rica. They kind of transitioned to Costa Rica, had a change of field, but they continue to serve the Lord. Uh, in reading their newsletter, they have had some of the same issues that we've had as far as they've not been able to meet as, the church for, as a church for uh, about three or four months now. And so do be in prayer for them. They're continuing to minister. They're doing some things online. Uh, Jeremy's been asked to teach a class on soteriology. Uh, he's also mentoring some pastors. And so they continue to work as they can. This is one of our missionaries. Keep them in your prayers and ask that the Lord will give them fruit for the labor. Keep them encouraged. And then also for the girls, Elijah's not there yet, but with their schooling and the things that are being done with that. And so keep that family. Our missionaries of the week, the uh, Jeremy and Michelle Blands and their children, Lila, Elowen, and Elijah. So those are our missionaries. Hey, let's have a word of prayer as we begin and lift these up before the Lord and the needs that they have. And then we'll get into our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And Lord, I do thank you for the evening that you've given us. I pray that you'll bless our time together. Uh, Lord, even as we come together, we're aware of those, some within our church family, our extended church family and uh, friends or acquaintances. I pray that you would just um, meet their needs in a special way. I pray that you'll give healing for some that have had procedures, give wisdom to doctors and treatments, give grace where grace is needed. Lord, we do lift up this family that was... Uh, uh, went through the, the tragedy of the fire, pray that you'll meet their needs, provide for them in a special way. Lord, we pray for our missionaries, the Blands, as they minister there in Costa Rica. There are so many things that uh, need to be done and so many things with, the, uh, with ministry like that that can uh, sometimes be difficult, and then especially with the complications through this pandemic. 
pray that you'll minister to them meet their needs keep them encouraged give fruit for the labor be with brother jeremy as he teaches that he might be a help to establish those those pastors in sound doctrine we'll thank you for all that you do bless our time together around your word and we ask this in jesus name amen i trust you've had a chance to find second corinthians chapter five in your bible and uh we're going to read, we're actually going to start at verse 14, read down through the end of the chapter, and then I'll come back and we will look at uh, the, uh, some verses and we're going to look at just a few words through some of the verses and then kind of give you the, what we've done before, the, the so what, what does this mean to me? So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, familiar verse, verse 14, many of you perhaps can even quote this verse. Notice what it says. It says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Paul's referring to the fact of Christ and his ascension. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead that ye be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of of God in him great passage here a lot of truths in it we're not going to take time to go into all of it in great depth but we are going to take and kind of take some of these verses choose some words kind of call your attention to the truth kind of the meaning behind some of those words and I trust it'll be a help to you verse 14 is a verse that many are familiar with for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge if one died for all then we're all dead now notice what he says here he says if Christ had to die for all of us, the reason must be because all of us were dead. We were dead in trespasses and sins. There are two words that I want to call your attention to in this verse and just kind of give you a few things uh, about them. The first of all, he says, for the love of Christ, and he uses that word, constraineth us. The love of Christ constraineth us. That word constrain literally means to, to hold together. It comes from a root that means to hold and a prefix that means together. So it means to hold together. Some, some uh, uh, commentators also will say that it has the idea of narrowing, bringing into a, into a channel. Almost like the idea if you've ever been on a river and especially one that goes through some mountainous areas, maybe you've been rafting or something like that. You'll come to a place in the river where maybe there'll be rock walls and those rock walls will close in and they'll bring that river together and narrow that river. When that happens, what, will, what occurs, that river when it's wide, many times it will flow very smoothly. But when you narrow it, what it does is it increases the force upon that water and brings it through that channel in a, in a more condensed and formed in energetic way because from each side the walls are pressing in against that water that's the idea of that constraineth us he says there's something that narrows my focus there is something that that brings a singleness of purpose to us and that thing that it is is the love of Christ for the love of Christ constraineth us, brings and presses us together, narrows our focus, narrows our purpose and our path. That's what he's giving you here. And then he says, because we thus judge. 
Now the word there, judge, it literally means just we, de we determine or we conclude. We look at this and we come to this conclusion. The love of Christ narrows our focus. And in this, it brings a clarity to us and a conclusion by us. And this is what it is. If one died for all, if Christ had to die for everyone to pay the penalty for their sin, it must be because all of us were dead in trespasses and sins. So that's what it gives you in this verse. The love of Christ constrains me, brings a single narrow approach and, and purpose in life. To me. That's a good verse. Skip down to verse 17. You have, you, you can see verses, he follows that in verse 15. He died for all that we should live, not to ourselves, but we should live unto him that died for us. And, uh, and he comes down to verse 17. And then this is the next verse. I'm going to give you just one word from this one. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, now look at that. <clears throat> if any man be in Christ, if any man has been redeemed, if any man has been saved, he is a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now that word creature, mark that, you can kind of write off to the side. There are, there are kind of two concepts in this idea of being a new creature this, that he uses there. Sometimes you see some of call it creation. We're a new creature. The reason they do that is they're kind of, there are two aspects. The first aspect is the act of creating something which God did that in Genesis. There's the act of creating, or there's the creative act in process as it is fulfilling itself, as, as it's being brought about. Uh, one commentator I was reading, he says that when we find this used in Galatians 6.15, we find there it was God's creative act in salvation. Here's what Galatians says in Ch Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. What he's saying, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't gain you any new merit. But in Jesus Christ, he says, but a new creature. That is the instantaneous act of God creating us in Christ Jesus. Salvation. Then he says here... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What we, I think, have here is what we are becoming as believers. We are becoming, we've been, we've been, there's been a new life. We're a new creation. We are different from the old. And so you see, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. You see that? Result that comes, that first in time and place and priority of Christ in that salvation act and what he does. We're a new creature. We're a new creation that he gives us here. So that's a verse, that's a word I want to call your attention. Now look at the very next verse. Because of that, he then takes on a subject that you'll find this word several times throughout the remainder of this chapter. And he talks about reconciliation. Look at verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So he starts off by saying, God reconciled us to himself. Now, what does that word reconcile mean? What, is it, what does it mean? Uh, its root form actually means to change or exchange. To change or exchange. Uh, it would be used in money. If you've ever traveled to a, another country that did not use U.S. currency, one of the things that you'll oftentimes do when you get there, you arrive in the country, they'll take you to a place where you can exchange some of your U.S. currency for some currency from that country. If it's in Europe, it may be the euro. Uh, it, it can be Filipino money. It can be whatever it is. Uh, you, can, you can exchange one, one country's money for another. That's, that's kind of the idea. But when it comes to people 
it's more talking about a change in relationship. So what God did when he saved us is he changed us from being at enmity with him to being in friendship with him. We went from en enmity to friendship. We went from at war to being at peace. And so he says, and how he did, he says, and all things, and, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself. How? Through Jesus Christ. You see, God accomplished this through the exercise of grace, but that grace was made available only through Jesus Christ. The reason that is so is because God in his holiness could not ignore our sin, but God through Jesus Christ could offer us grace and forgiveness for our sin. And so he says here, that word reconciled, it means to change or exchange. When we talk about with God, we became, we're no longer enemies, but we're now friends, we're now children, we're now family. And so that's what he's given us there. So I think that reconciled is a good word for you to note. Look at verse 19. There are, there are a few words here I just want to call your attention to very simply. And note about it. So now we come to verse 19, and he says this, to wit, that's, this God has, that God ha was in Christ, here's that word, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. We talked about trespasses when we studied and that, that kind of that three-week session on sin where we talked about sin, trespass, transgression, and iniquity. We talked about that. Here you've got that word. Not imputing our, their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So the first word I want you to notice here is the word imputing. The word imputing. The word imputing means to put down on a person's account to put down on a person's account I remember when I was growing up my mom and dad had an account at uh, the local grocery store and if my mom needed to send us by for something and and maybe we might not have money with us or she might not have money to give us right then we could go by that grocery store it's a little just community grocery store type place and we could go in there and pick up whatever it was that we needed and when it came, when we came to check out we would take the the items we had they would ring up the total and then they would take a little tab and they would write rushing and write whatever the total was seven dollars and 89 cents or ten dollars and 15 cents or whatever it was and they would put that on our tab and it kept a running tab and then my mom or dad would go by periodically and pay that off the idea of imputing is the idea of marking on someone's ledger a bill that they owe a debt that they have so that rather than collecting it at the moment they may pay it off later. Sometimes you can do that if you stay at a hotel. Some hotels you can take and they will, if you, they have a restaurant, you can eat there at the restaurant and you can charge that to your hotel room. Then when you check out, you settle up that bill. That's what this word impute means, is to put down on a person's account. But notice what it God did. God was in Christ reconciling the world himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. In Jesus Christ, what God did was instead of writing our sin debt on our account, he wrote it on the account of Jesus Christ. And he took the debt of our sin. That's what the cross was all about. The very last that chapter of this the verse of this chapter and he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin Christ allowed and God took and imputed our sin not against us but on the account of the Lord Jesus Christ so that's that word imputing the next word I want you to see is the word committed because God did that he has place something in our trust that word committed literally means to place in our trust give us 
the responsibility for something. Hath committed unto us, now look at what he says, the word of reconciliation. So he's talked about being reconciled to himself. He's talked about the ministry of reconciliation. Now he's talking about the word of reconciliation. What does that mean? The word of reconciliation. We have the message to tell others that Christ has paid for their sin so that they don't have to bear that burden. That's what he's talking about here. The ministry, the word of reconciliation. We have that message. So you have imputing, you have committed, and you have the word of reconciliation. Let me call your attention to one more word. It's down in verse 20, and then we're going to do our so what, some things that we can draw from this passage. Look at verse 20 and notice what it says. It says this. Now, now then, now because of everything he's been talking about, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors. What an amazing statement. If you know what an ambassador is, and if you just look it up in a dictionary, it'll give you a good definition. An ambassador, here's what the dictionary says it is. An official of highest rank. Let me stop right there and tell you this. Can I tell you this? If you're a child of God, you have a high rank. Don't ever think lowly, low of yourself or, or negative of yourself. Think justly and rightly. Think humbly. But don't think in low self-esteem. It's an official of highest rank sent by one country to another as its resident representative. Now listen to that again. An official of highest rank sent by one country to another as its resident representative. Now think that through. What is our role here on this earth? Our role is this. We are the representatives of heaven whom God has chosen to let us reside here and let the world know about the message of reconciliation, that they can be a part of his kingdom as well. What a great verse that is. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Now, what can we take from this? I love that last verse, by the way, verse tw uh, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what can we take from this? What truths can we glean as we go through this passage tonight? Let me give you five things as we finish up. You can write them down. I'll give you kind of the verse reference that goes with it. We read God's Word and we understand, hey, God's Word is supposed to have a, a reason, a help, a purpose for me. What is it I can take from this and apply to my daily life? Number one, the first thing I see here is an awareness of the love of Christ will create a more narrow focus in my life. Listen closely. An awareness of the love of Christ will create a more narrow focus in my life. When I truly become overwhelmed by the love of Christ, for the love of Christ constraineth us, it will narrow my focus. It will bring a, a singleness of purpose so that everything else that I do feeds to that one end. Feeds to that one end. Uh, yesterday I was in the office yesterday morning early studying and, and heard a familiar sound. I've heard it multiple times before. I heard the sound of the collision of two vehicles. And, uh, of course, I grabbed my phone, walked toward the door of the office, and as I looked out, recognized that I already had the number dialing, called 911, said, listen, we've got an accident at the corner of 32nd and, and Clio, and uh, was walking that way, and the, uh, they, they began to ask me about the uh, 
uh, about the individuals in the wreck, how many cars and what type of cars and a lot of questions. I started telling, I said, okay, on the one car, there's, there's one person in it. On the other car, yes, it looks like I do have, there are some injuries. Probably you do need to send an ambulance. But we went through the process of that. And then over the next little bit, I was uh, able to be a blessing and be a help and, and encouragement. It was a little bit of a stressful day for one of the people and, and one of the others, a little 12-year-old girl that needed to be checked at the hospital and uh, with a leg that was hurting her and so ended up being kind of blessing. And, and I began to think about it. You know, it would have been easy because I was here early that morning. I was here early and I was, I was studying. I was kind of getting ready, looking toward uh, tonight. And as I was working on that, it would have been easy for me to have lost sight of the fact of why I'm here. But what it gave me an opportunity, I was reminded of in that, it was an opportunity for me to show Christ in a scenario that I had become connected to. And so I went out and I was able to check on the one driver and went and checked on the other family and back and forth, ended up and helped some of them get, a couple of the family members get to the hospital and tried to be an encouragement to the, to the other driver and, and the different things. You know, sometimes we can get so busy knowing the things that we've got to get done in a day, we forget the reason we're here. The, an awareness of the love of Christ will create a more narrow focus in my life. Number two, the second thing I see here, and we find it in verse 17, my new life in Christ should leave my old ways behind. My new life in Christ should leave my old ways behind. I'm afraid some, too many times we as believers, even though we know Christ as our Savior, we know heaven as our home, there are still too many things that we keep pulling in from our past, from the old man, from the dead man. We keep pulling them in. When God said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Can I say this? My new life in Christ should leave my old ways behind. Now we know those old ways die hard and it can be a struggle every day, but we should begin to become more like Christ and less like what we were before we came to him. Number three, the third thing here, and you see it in verse 18, and it's uh, through his grace, God has brought an end to my condition of enmity or hostility. Do you realize before we got saved, we were at war with God. The father of lies, the father of darkness, the devil and all of his demons and all the, all the resistance and opposition they want to give to God. Remember what Jesus said in John 8 when he talked to religious leaders? He said, you are of your, of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. And he talked about him being a liar from the beginning. When I got saved, the grace of God took me from a condition of hostility with, toward God to a condition of family of God. So that's so important. He tells us that in verse 18. Through his grace, God brought an end to my condition of enmity. Number four, and this is something I'm sure you all know, verse 19, as we looked at it, God accomplished this by putting my sin on Jesus Christ. The way that God was able to bring an end to that war is he placed my sin on Christ's ledger and Christ paid for it. I hope you never get over that. I hope you never get too far from that wonderful truth and you're constantly reminded, hey, God placed my sin on his only begotten son. The only way it could happen God accomplished it by putting my sin on Jesus. 
the last thing and we find in verses 19 and 20. I've been placed on earth to serve as a representative of God's and to share the message of reconciliation. Why did God, why did God, why does God leave us here on this earth after we've been saved? Why does he allow us to stay here in this world? He says this in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We've got the good news. We've got the news of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors. I've been placed on this earth to let those who haven't heard know the war's over. The battle's over. The victory's been won. Your sin has been paid for. All you have to do is, by faith, Accept God's offer of grace. What a great passage it has here. It's a reminder to all of us who are believers. By the way, it was written to a church that was struggling with some areas of carnality, some struggles and some strife within. And Paul writes to this church to remind them and to narrow their focus back. Say, look, this is why you're here. You're here to be a representative of God in this world and to let this world know the good news of forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful passage of Scripture. I trust those words or some things. I trust you took some notes, marked some things down. Uh, be in prayer for the services on Sunday. Pray, we look forward to a good day. We're continuing our series on revival. Let me remind some of you that maybe haven't been able to get out or have chosen not to get out. We are meeting. We are practicing proper protocol for social distancing and being careful in some areas. We'd love to see you in church. We understand that for some of you that have weak immune systems, but we'd love to see you in your place. Had a good uh, day this past week. Had some guests with us in church. We'd love to see you back. Don't forget on Sunday evening we have our uh, uh, we have our uh, life groups and be a part of that. Had a good week this past week. I had a chance to speak to the young people and uh, Brother Stan spoke to the mixed adult class. Miss Linda took the my wife Linda took the, um, uh, continued her teaching of the ladies' class. Look forward to a great day on Sunday. Be praying for the services. Be in your place and uh, ask, be praying, asking the Lord to do a great work. For those of you that are interested, don't forget in the morning at uh, 7 a.m., we do have our prayer time. And uh, we want to encourage you to join us if you need uh, the ID and the password to be able to join us for prayer time. If you'll contact Angie or myself, we'll get that to you. Hey, we love you. Thanks for joining us. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, we love you, and we do thank you for the opportunity we've had to open your word tonight. Lord, you tell us that all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable to us. May we gain profit. May we enjoy the value of this Scripture. May it, may it mold us and may it motivate us for what you long for us to do. Well, thank you for all that you do. Lord, we, we thank you for our missionaries that we've already prayed for. We pray for our church family who's dealing with some of the, uh, some with illnesses, some with other things. Pray that you'll meet those needs. And, and uh, Lord, we, on, we realize we're only able to even come to you in prayer through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you make that possible. We ask this in Jesus' name.